Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight, uh, to be able to speak in this hall and to be here at the Oriental Institute. It's a big thrill for me. Anybody who is interested in the history of the modern Middle East, especially how the troubled nation of Iraq came to be, will inevitably come across this remarkable person, an English woman by the name of Gertrude Bell, who lived in the early part of the 20th century. Although known as an avid traveler to remote desert places and the author of several popular travel books, it was perhaps Bell's political career for which she is the most famous. It was Bell who was largely at the center of the birth of the Iraqi nation in the 1920s, having served to fix that country's borders, having assisted in writing its new constitution, and having helped to uh, select its first king. With all these achievements, it's not surprising to find that Bell's life has been documented in several books that have appeared over the last few decades. What you see here are the covers of two biographies of Bell that you might be familiar with, uh, one entitled on the left, Desert Queen by Janet Wallach, and the other with a similar title, uh, Gertrude Bell, Queen of the Desert, Shaper of Nations by Georgina Howell. These books are also very interesting in that they focus not only on her political achievements, but a fair bit on her personal life, including her torrid love affairs, which unfortunately all ended in tragedy. And of course, with Belle's reputation as an intrepid desert traveler and her connection to the troubled Middle East, how could Hollywood resist such a woman? So here you see some of the images from the 2015 film about Gertrude Bell entitled Queen of the Desert, directed by Werner Herzog and starring Nicole Kidman as Gertrude Bell, uh, Robert Pattison as Bell's friend and ally, T.E. Lawrence, rather unbelievable, and James Franco and Damian Lewis as her two lovers. And finally, and who has seen this movie, by the way? Has anybody, what did you think of it? We can't see it in the U.S. We I can't see it in Canada yet either, so I haven't encountered too many people who have actually seen it. Not great. Finally, a very good uh, documentary film narrated and produced by Tilda Swinton uh, called Letters from Baghdad, Baghdad that just recently has been released. It's currently doing the circuit of film festivals. Actually, it's uh, showing tomorrow night in Beirut and on October 9th in uh, London. Uh, so that's quite current. <coughs> Unfortunately, what many of these accounts do not concentrate on very much, uh, except for that latter bi uh, 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 biography, uh, uh, the, the filmmaker showed a great deal of interest in archaeology, um, but the others don't focus very much on how archaeology played a major role in Gertrude Bell's life. Archaeology was something that she was deeply fascinated by. It grew from a simple curiosity to a subject of serious scholarly pursuit and ultimately led to her making important decisions about the heritage of the country, Iraq, that she would help to create. So being an archaeologist myself and somebody who specializes in the archaeology of the Near or Middle East, I thought it might be interesting to look beyond what the popular biographies have said about this fascinating person and delve more deeply into her activities in the spheres of antiquity and archaeology. So what I'd like to do for this lecture this evening is first take you briefly uh, through the main points, through the main events of Bell's life. And I'm guessing some of you here tonight already know a great deal about this person. But there uh, may be some of you who do not know much about her. Uh, so we'll have a short introduction, a short review of Bell's principal accomplishments. And then I will turn to her archaeological endeavors and try to give my own assessment of her achievements in this field. My main focus will be on the years between around 1909 and 1914, when Bell was most thoroughly engaged in the archaeology of Mesopotamia and produced her most significant archaeological reports. I will then talk briefly at the end about how that archaeological experience impacted her later political career and in part shaped her perspective about the future of the new country of Iraq. So beginning with Bell's origins, she was born in 1868 in northern England, 
Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell was the daughter of Hugh Bell and the granddaughter of the famous Isaac Lothian Bell, one of England's leading industrialists of the Victorian era. Not only was Lothian Bell uh, a very successful businessman known for his operation of one of Northern England's largest ironworks and collieries, but he was also a noted scholar in the fields of engineering and industry and had an energetic political career as well. So Gertrude was born into a high-achieving English family, surrounded by money and society, and these things would contribute much to her pursuit of a higher education, to her extensive travels around the world, and to the ease with which she was able to make connections with important individuals, both at home and abroad. And so in the portraits there, you can see on the left uh, uh, Sir Isaac Lothian Bell, Gertrude's grandfather. You can see on one side of that portrait, he is actually engraved or etched in a diagram of a blast furnace which he would himself would have planned and, uh, uh, and manufactured um, which is kind of odd <laughs> I think um, and there you can see Gertrude at the age of three Already at a young age, Bell had demonstrated a passion for learning, and so she was sent up to Oxford to continue her studies. This was a time in England when Oxford was a university for men only, but a small women's college had recently been opened, and it allowed a small number of women, including Bell, to attend the university lectures and to sit for its examinations. Uh, despite being one of only a handful of women uh, filled uh, uh, in lecture halls filled with hundreds of men. And uh, what they did with the women is they put them on the front of the lecture hall on the, on the stage, on the podium with the lecture, and they were seated at a table with their backs to the men in the, in the, uh, in the classroom. <laughs> Anyway, with this kind of an experience, she nonetheless flourished in the academic environment. Uh, by the end of her second year, she has succeeded in receiving a first in modern history, the first woman in Oxford at Oxford to achieve that honor. Um, you can see that first photograph was taken at the age of 19, and here's another one that was taken later, slightly later in life, when she was about 26 years old. By this time, she had traveled widely and had published her first book based on her visit to Persia in 1892, so about 10 years after, or less than 10 years. After the completion of her education, Bell traveled extensively through Europe and grew particularly fond of the Swiss Alps. So during the years between 1887 and 1904, she actually established herself as a capable mountaineer. She climbed no fewer than 10 mountain peaks or ranges, including the death-defying Finster Arhorn, a photo of which you see there, rising up over 14,000 feet. It's notorious for its bad weather and frequent avalanches. Bell and her male climbing companions actually got within the few hundred feet of the peak when terrible weather in the form of a blizzard and a violent electrical storm forced them to turn back. And while this account, uh, while this ascent was a failure, it did earn her a tremendous respect within the climbing community. And she certainly uh, did successfully scale other mountains in the Alps, including the Engelhorner mountain range, one of whose peaks was named after her, the Gertrude Spitzer. The opening decade of the 20th century also saw Bell traveling far and wide across the globe. She completed two world tours, for example, but her fondest and most memorable trips were those which took her through parts of the Near East. In the years 1900, 1902, and 1905, she made several trips to the Near East, traveling to the regions of the Levant and Anatolia, and visiting the famous and ancient cities of Jerusalem, Beirut, Damascus, Aleppo, and Constantinople. Uh, you can see there some photographs of some of the places visited during her 1900 and 1905 trips to the Near East, including the castle of Shazar, which is in the lower uh, right-hand uh, corner there uh, in western Syria. Area, the Temple of Bel Shamin in Palmyra, okay, that's the top left there, uh, now destroyed, unfortunately, by the Islamic State last year, and a rock cut tomb from the site of Petra in present day Jordan on the upper right side. 
You should know, by the way, that by this time, Belle had acquired for herself many of the languages of the countries through which she was journeying. She had become conversant, conversant in Persian when she had traveled to that country back in 1892. And with her more recent trips to the East, she had acquired the ability to speak and read in Arabic and Turkish. Belle was now traveling as a sole Englishwoman, Although she always had a male escort of Arab guides, cooks, and baggage handlers, and although she bore the discomforts of sleeping in a tent, her traveling situation wasn't altogether primitive. We are here talking about a proper English lady who had been brought up in the Victorian era, and it would have been most improper if she had neglected to bring along her chest of fine china and crystal with which she could enjoy her evening meals. She also carried around a canvas bathtub, which could be rigged up in the evening and filled with water so that she could always look and feel decently presentable whenever she was, wherever she was in her remote wanderings. Belle's constant interactions with her own traveling party, as well as her numerous encounters with local tribesmen, villagers, and townspeople along the way with whom she frequently had long chats while sipping tea in the shade of their tents or partaking in meals in the cool of their mud brick huts, served only to improve her language abilities in Arabic. And she immensely enjoyed these exchanges, finding the peoples whom she encountered thoroughly gracious, generous, possessing good humor, and always ready to flatter her with compliments about her intelligence and bravery. Gertrude Bell found that travel, particularly travel through difficult to access desert places was the thing that made her the most happy. And so we find her taking her most daring journey in 1914 into the desert wastes of Arabia with the objective of getting to the medieval city of Ha'il, the headquarters of a powerful desert sheikh named Ibn Rashid. Okay, so it's located down here on the map. She started up in Damascus for that trip. After a long journey, Belle finally reached the city of Ha'il, only to find herself a virtual prisoner of the emir, being forbidden to leave the room of one of his palaces for several days. Finally, she was sent for and told to leave the city immediately, although she did get time to take some photographs of this exotic desert city and to describe some of the inhabitants of it. Throughout the rest of her political career, Belle would keep a close watch, close eye on the activities of the house of Ibn Rashid and also of Ibn Saud, the other rival leader to Ibn Rashid in Arabia. And she was frequently sought for advice about the situation in Arabia. You can see here a picture of the men of the Abu Tai, an Arab tribe whom Belle visited on her memorable 1914 journey into Arabia. Um, of course, the eventual outcome of this des desert rivalry, as you probably know, was the defeat of the House of Ibn Rashid by Ibn Saud and his consequent uh, conquest and domination of the entire Arabian Peninsula, now Saudi Arabia. It is with the outbreak of World War I in 1914 that we see Bell entering into her famed political career. By this time, her travels through Arabia, the Levant, Anatolia, and Mesopotamia had made her a leading expert on the activities and mindsets of the Arab people. Because of her first-hand knowledge, she found herself being sought after by the leading military and political strategists of the war, first in the British Office of Military Intelligence in Cairo, and later in the Arab Bureau in Basra in Mesopotamia. After the British forces were able to push the Turks out of the region, she was moved up to Baghdad, where she was appointed as Oriental Secretary to the British Commissioner. This was followed at the end of the war with an invitation to Paris to attend the peace talks and to provide important advice on the future governance, governing of Mesopotamia, the country with which she had now become well acquainted. The Paris Peace Conference of 1919 marked an important shift in Bell's position regarding the future of the Arab people and especially the future of Mesopotamia. Whereas before, she had always insisted that it should be carefully administered and controlled by the British, believing the Arabs to be incapable of self-rule, she now began to see things differently. Eventually, she came to believe that Mesopotamia, or the Iraq, or Iraq as it was now being called, should become its own nation. 
And this opinion was pretty much in keeping with what actually happened in Mesopotamia. After the war, it was officially mandated to Britain, but even so, in an effort, in a bow in the direction of Arab self-determination, Britain, Britain decided to provide Mesopotamia with a national leader. This was to be a pliable leader and who, someone who was loyal to the British, but he was to be a king nonetheless, and he could exercise some control over his country's own affairs and government. And so in 1921, at a conference in Cairo with Winston Churchill as the colonial secretary, and you can see a photograph of, uh, from that conference, it was agreed that Prince Faisal, the king of uh, the son of King Hussein of the Hejaz, the Sharif of Mecca, should be made the new ruler of the new country of Iraq. So here you see a photograph of the delegates of the Cairo Conference. You can make out, hopefully, Winston Churchill in the front there. You might also be able to see or uh, identify who's this. That's T.E. Lawrence. And then we have Gertrude Bell over here with her flowered hat and her fox furs there. And of course, people often notice the lion cubs, so very sort of imperialist-like type of uh, scene there. Um, and of course, uh, this other famous photograph uh, uh, from the same time showing Bell flanked by Winston Churchill and T.E. Lawrence on their camels posing in front of the Sphinx and the pyramids. With the newly formed nation of Iraq, Bell continued to exercise considerable influence in Baghdad. She had become one of Faisal's trusted advisors, and a happy and close relationship developed between the two of them. She also helped to run Iraq's civil administration and assisted with drawing up the country's official boundaries, which included the territories around Basra, Baghdad, and Mosul in the north. And last, Bell's extensive experience in archaeology and her unparalleled knowledge of the antiquity of Iraq led to her appointment as the country's first honorary director of antiquities. This entailed drawing up the new laws governing how antiquities discovered in Iraq were to be handled and cared for and to whom they belonged. Drawing from her many years of archaeological experience, Bell's New Antiquities Law stipulated that all future excavations, archaeological missions, had to conduct their excavation work with the utmost care, using modern techniques of digging. Teams were obliged to have certain experts on the team, including an epigraphist, an architect, and a competent photographer. Most importantly, the law stipulated that at least half of all antiquities dug in the country of Iraq were the property of Iraq and would go to Iraq's museum collections. Uh, in this photograph, you can see Bell at the ancient site of Kish inspecting artifacts that had just been excavating, and she is selecting some of those that will be destined for the new Iraq Museum. By the way, the excavations at Kish at this time were co-sponsored by the Chicago Field Museum and Oxford University. So there is a Chicago connection there. Um, and here you can see uh, her with the English archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley at the important Sumerian site of Ur in southern Iraq. Uh, many of you will know that Ur was to be one of the most spectacular of all ancient sites dug in Iraq during the 20th century, owing largely to the discovery of several royal tombs dating back to the period of Sumerian civilization some 4,500 years ago. So Bell would have seen some of those treasures shortly after they had come out of the ground, and she is the reason why why some of the pieces ended up in the museum in Baghdad, such as the lovely helmet of Meskalamdug and the golden bull's lyre, which you see here. Uh, so she was the one who selected these for the new Iraq museum. Uh, fortunately, these were not among the items that were looted uh, uh, when the Iraq museum uh, was broken into and plundered in 2003. These were all had already been taken and uh, put safely into a bank vault. So to the best of my knowledge, they're still intact intact and accounted for. Of course, she also has a connection with uh, James Henry Breasted. Um, he was uh, passing through Mesopotamia in 1920, and she did meet him on that occasion. They uh, went to the site of Akar Kuf together, uh, the site of uh, the Kassite uh, capital. Um, she was also with her father. We don't have any information from her own letters about her encounter with Breasted. We only have what he says about her, and he calls her a blue stocking. Apparently that means, and I didn't know actually, it means a very intelligent woman, but often uh, the woman is frumpy. 
which I think is a bit unfair because I think she was always generally considered to be very well dressed. Anyway. Despite her uh, great political successes, Belle's personal life had never been particularly happy. Her parents had, for, had forbidden her to marry her first love, which was a young penniless diplomat whom she had met in Persia. Later in life, she fell deeply in love with a married military officer and diplomat by the name of Charles Doughty Wiley, with whom she exchanged many love letters. Um, But this relationship came to a terrible end when Doughty Wiley was killed at Gallipoli in 1915. Nonetheless, through all of her tragic romances, Gertrude's relationship with her own family remained strong, especially with her father, Hugh, and her stepmother, to whom she wrote frequent and detailed letters of her adventures and achievements. It is, in fact, these letters that we have the most illuminating picture, not only of the amazing events that Gertrude took part in, but her special personality with her boundless energy, her natural curiosity for all things around her, and her deep commitment to her family, friends, and the new country of Iraq that she would help to create and where she would eventually die. She died in Baghdad in 1926, apparently by an overdose of sleeping pills. Now, given Bell's eventual, uh, eventful life, as I've outlined, it's difficult to imagine that she would have been capable of any more achievements, uh, but indeed she was capable, and not to any small degree. Uh, to Bell's life, we may attribute a host of archaeological achievements, which I'll now outline here, with a special focus on the work that she carried out between 1909 and 1914 in Mesopotamia. But first, let's just get a brief lead-up to that time in her life. Before her first journey into Mesopotamia in 1909, Belle, as we've already seen, had become an experienced traveler. She had ventured to many places around the world, including the Near East. As a traveler, Belle was a gifted observer, taking note of all things she saw, including the landscapes through which she passed, the behavior, mindset, and activities of the people she encountered, and also now ancient sites and monuments that she visited. Her first travel book... The Desert and the Sown is a description of her 1905 travels in the Near East, and it contains an an interesting mixture of ethnographic observations, geographical data, historical notes, and descriptions of ancient monuments. So we really see with this book the first glimmerings of Bell's archaeological interests in this book, The Desert and the Sown. Although her observations and descriptions in this book really read more like an armchair's guide to famous monuments, she's not really going off the beaten track just yet. Um, And so they don't really advance the field of archaeological knowledge to any great extent, but we can see certainly a keen interest there. Bell's archaeological skills were to improve shortly after this time. On her way back from her 1905 trip to the Levant, Bell passed through Turkey, where she visited several Roman and Byzantine churches, the most fascinating of which were the ruined remains of a site near Konya called, so-called, the Thousand and One Churches, or Binbir Kilisi, as they are known in Turkish. Here, Bell met up with the famous archaeologist William Ramsey, and it was decided that they should collaborate on an archaeological project to investigate and excavate the churches of Binbir Kilisi. This collaboration took uh, place in 1907. It was largely funded by Bell and resulted in a co-authored book by Ramsey and Bell published in 1909. You can see the covers, uh, the cover of that book. Remarkably, Bell was responsible for two of the four chapters of this learned report. It was she who wrote the most detailed architectural notes, taking each church as she went and dissecting it technically and historically. She she really uh, accomplished this work with great care and diligence and enhanced her study with the inclusion of many photographs of the ruined churches. She recognized the tremendous importance of having good photographic records of archaeological remains and would continue on all future expeditions to carry a camera to take pictures. Not only were Bell's archaeological interests sparked by her travels and fieldwork, several scholars were now making an impact on the direction of her research and were an important source of inspiration for her as she prepared for her first journey into, into Mesopotamia in 1909. 
Included among these individuals was Solomon Reinach on the left there, a French archaeologist and editor of the renowned journal Revue Archéologie, David George Hogarth in the center, an archaeologist who was an expert not only in the Aegean and Greek worlds, but also on the ancient Near East and Egypt. Hogarth's interests in the early periods of Near Eastern antiquity reflected at this time by his interest in the art and inscriptions of the Neo-Hittite uh, Neo Hittites at Carchemish, which is a site in northern Syria, this was a site he himself was excavating, may go far to explain Bell's own stepped up interest in the pre classical period and her attempts to visit and report on several pre classical monuments and tell sites during her Mesopotamian trip. A German scholar on the right there by the name of Joseph Strugowski probably had the greatest impact on Bell's archaeological research. His expertise was primarily the Hellenistic, Byzantine, and early Islamic periods of the Near East, and he had an unprecedented knowledge of the material culture of those eras. Strugowski had become disillusioned with the old traditional notion that the classical world, especially Rome, was the origin of all great Western art. On the contrary, he argued it was the Orient, and by this term he means the Near East, that was the source of a great number of important developments, and that these had spread over to the West, ultimately affecting uh, the development of European medieval art and architecture. Uh, Bell, too, subscribed to the importance and influence of Near Eastern art and architecture, and uh, throughout her scholarship, she would follow very closely, closely Strugowski's overall methodological approaches, architectural typologies, and categorizations. So let's now move to the year 1909 and look at the journey which Bell embarked on into Mesopotamia. So I've circled the area that we're going to be looking at here. So she began her journey up in Aleppo. So let's go to the next map. So this is actually a folding map that appears at the back of her book, Amarath to Amarath, which is a report of her 1909 journey into Mesopotamia. And on the map here, this is where she started in Aleppo. From there, she, took, uh, she went overland. Okay? She's on horseback for the most part on this trip, not camels. So she went overland over to the Euphrates River and crossed the Euphrates River not far to the south, not too far uh, below Carchemish, which is where uh, Hogarth and his team were working. She then traveled down the east bank of the Euphrates River through what is today Syria, getting down into, just over the border, into Iraq. And then at the city or the town of Heat, which is right about here, she crossed back over the river and then started making her way into the desert where she found, where she passed by the very striking palace of Ukadir. And I'll come back to that site because that's a very important uh, site for her. She then made her way back to the Euphrates, passed by Babylon, and then came up to Baghdad. It's very hard for me to see where Baghdad is, somewhere in there. And then up the Tigris River, going past the sites of Ashur and Nimrud in the Assyrian area, and then back up into Anatolia, making her way through Anatolia as far west as Konya, which is over here where she finished her trip. Quite an incredible uh, journey. Some of the highlights of this amazing journey were captured by the wonderful photographs of the sites. I just love these photographs of the sites, monuments, and landscapes through which he passed. The Robinson Library of Newcastle University in Northern England is the keeper of the Gertrude Bell archives. And in addition to housing most of her diaries, letters, and notebooks, the archives has also all of her black and white photographs from this trip, including, yeah, there's, there's hundreds from the 1909 trip. And one may note that not only did she carry a conventional handheld camera, she also brought a second camera that was designed for taking panoramic views. So you can see one of her panoramas at the top there, this looking over the Euphrates River at the site of Tel Ahmar, which is right on the uh, right alongside the Euphrates River. And it really captures the landscape of that, of that, particular, of that particular time. Uh, I had a chance to go back there in 1995 you can see how the river course is changed. It flows quite a ways uh, further to the west. Uh, today, or certainly up to, well, I guess still today, I hope, um, uh, this whole, uh, whole uh, valley area has been completely flooded. 
So uh, the landscape has, again, changed a great deal. Bell's photography has also captured the appearance of many sites and monuments that have since disappeared or become severely damaged because of modern looting and recent destructions brought upon by the war in Syria. Now, in order to highlight the value of her photographs, I made a short trip with a colleague of mine, Steve Batiak, in 2009 to see if I could photograph some of the same monuments and sites that Bell had taken just over 100 years before. Uh, like Bell, my journey started at the city of Aleppo before traveling down the eastern side of the Euphrates River. I got as far as the city of Deir Azor. And it became quickly apparent that while some things along this stretch of the river had changed very little, others had altered a great deal. So just starting in Aleppo, uh, we can, sorry, just starting in Aleppo, we can visit some of the uh, places that she photographed in that city. We can visit, for example, the Khan al-Wazir, which was built during the 17th century of the Ottoman period and functioned not only as a guest house, but also as a place of mercantile activities, accommodated with shops and offices, as well as guest lodgings. By Bell's time, the Khan had turned into a manufactory for dyed cloth, which you see draped over the second story balcony. While up until recently, so that's my photograph in 2009, it had shops for antiquities, carpets, and local artisans. In my photograph, you can see that the main structure of the Khan is still intact, as is the beautiful carved decoration that you see around the windows and on the walls, for which the place is well known. Uh, sadly, the war in Syria has been very unkind to these places in the old city of Aleppo. This photograph taken, I got it off the internet in 2013, shows that parts of the Khan al-Wazir have been reduced to rubble. Similarly, you can see Bell's photograph of the great Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo, which stands in the center of the old city with its beautiful minaret, which was added to that mosque in the 11th century. You can see my 2009 photograph in which the uh, mosque is almost completely obscured by satellite dishes. Uh, sadly, during 2013, parts of the great mosque were burned, sections of its ceiling collapsed, and that minaret came down amid an exchange of heavy, heavy weapons fire. Traveling to the east of Aleppo, over to the Euphrates River, which Bell journeyed down towards Mesopotamia, she passed by two Roman period tower tombs, which stand on the crest of a high ridge to the east of the village of Serene. Uh, these are dated to the first century CE, and they are erected during the Roman period. They contain one or more inhumations that were placed either in the lower or the upper chamber. You're looking at one of these tower tombs. The other one has been completely, it's, it's no longer preserved, and it was in very poor shape when Bell visited the other one back in 1909. Um, in her time, you can see that this particular uh, tower, tomb, uh, had a second story that was decorated with fluted columns. So they're right here. Um, and they have these uh, Doric capitals that support a kind of, a, sorry, an ionic, ionic capitals supporting an ionic architrave. According to Bell, the whole structure was probably surmounted by a stone pyramid, these having been found elsewhere in Syria and Anatolia. In my 2009 photograph, you can see that none of the top part of the monument exists at all. Uh, moreover, you can see that the piles of masonry over here are completely gone. Uh, this is probably the remains of another tower tomb that stood nearby. You can also see in the 2009 photo, there's a big pit here. This is a robber's pit. No doubt they were looking for another tomb, some tomb goodies. Uh, we actually did encounter quite a few of these robber pits around this tower tomb. So there were an, a number of graves in the area that have now been robbed. Further southeast along the Euphrates River is the Islamic period castle Kalat Jabar, which today stands as an island in the vast Lake Assad, formed after the completion of the massive hydroelectric Tabka Dam uh, directly to the south of it in the 1970s. Uh, much of this castle can be dated to the time of the Arab prince Nur ad-Din of the 12th century and then enjoyed further additions in the Mamluk period that followed. Excavations and restorations were carried out at Kalat Jabar over the course of the 
20th century. And some of the castle is still preserved, as you can see by this surviving uh, part of the outer fortification, which has changed very little over the last 100 years. So you can see my photograph, 2009, showing almost exactly the same amount of brickwork and stonework preserved. Um, but uh, other parts of Kalat Jabbar have not survived as well. So you can see here uh, this lovely baked uh, brick structure near the outer wall in the southwest, although still bearing uh, some of its decorative patterns of bricks, has sustained greater damage. Actually, you can see where the crack is in Bell's time, and so this whole bit has subsequently fallen down. Moving down into the heart of Mesopotamia, into what is today the country of Iraq, Bell made several visits to sites which had experienced their height of power and prosperity in pre-classical times. She visited the site of Babylon on the Euphrates River, for example, where a German team, under the direction of Robert Kaldavai, were digging. By this time, they had dug out much of the palace of the great Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, as well as the nearby spectacular Ishtar Gate, which was one of the ceremonial entrances into that great city, and whose brick walls are covered with the images of bulls and dragons. And you can see in this slide, uh, so this is the photograph of bells here, showing a detail of one of these, uh, of these dragons on uh, the brickwork of the Ishtar Gate. And then next to that, you can see a nice reconstruction of the gate, of the gate as it would have looked in Nebuchadnezzar's time in the 6th century BCE when the city of Babylon was at its most grand. Altogether, Gertrude was greatly impressed by the systematic way in which the Germans carried out their excavations at Babylon and their attention to architectural details and particularly to the German dig director, Robert Kaldavai, whom she found very friendly and very and fascinating. Um, the, when she writes about him in her diaries, it's very colorful. Um, you can see also the car uh, very carefully drawn plan of the city of Babylon, which was done up by Kaldavai and his German uh, colleagues. And just on a lighter note, if it's going to work. There, uh, you can see one of the German archaeologists feeding the local Babylonian cats there. When Bell arrived a little later at the site of Ashur on the Tigris River, she was no less impressed with the archaeological investigations going on there, directed by the German archaeologist Walter André. The Ashur excavations, like those conducted at Babylon, were a model of careful, systematic uh, work with attention paid to architectural details and stratigraphy. You can see some of the great uh, work that was done with photos like these. Um, here's also a, a photograph of one of the brick vaulted tombs uh, that are found at Ashur. Many of these are found underneath the floors of houses. Um, and you can see here a detailed plan of the ancient city of Ashur showing the position of the numerous temples and palaces, all carefully traced by the Germans during their work there. And one of Andre's own reconstructions, renderings, in which he reconstructs the city in its heyday of power around 1200 BCE. Bell found Andre to be a kind and generous person who happily shared all of his finds, plans, and ideas with her. And actually, Bell was so taken with this archaeologist and the prodigious nature of his scholarship, which significantly impacted her own archaeological research, she dedicated her 1914 monograph on the castle of Ukadir to him. You can see him there feeding a gazelle. Uh, here's another view. This is the uh, German team in 1909. Uh, Bell's photo of them. Andre is holding the cat. They seem to all like cats. And in 1911, this wonderful photo taken in the German dig house, her last evening there. Uh, Belle is in the center, and uh, to her left, your right, is Walter Andre. She's leaning slightly into him there. Traveling further up the Tigris, after Ashur, Bell passed by another important archaeological site of the ancient Assyrians. The site was Nimrud, its vast mounds marking the place of ancient Kalhu, 
known from the Bible and numerous ancient sources as one of the great capital cities of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. As probably a lot of you know, this city was founded by King Ashurnasirpal II in 878 BCE. During his reign, Ashurnasirpal II built a lavish palace, temples, and ziggurat on a high mound by the river, while later kings built additional palaces. And while the mud brick walls of these edifices had largely decayed, their materials within them, including innumerable inscribed clay tablets, stone statuary, and exquisitely carved stone panels were often found intact, and they reflect well the prosperity of Assyria and the power it once wielded when it was once the strongest empire in the ancient world. Bell would have been most familiar with the work of the English archaeologist Henry Laird, who had dug at Nimrud in the 1840s, and who was responsible for many of the discoveries at the site, including the beautiful carved wall reliefs from Ashurnasirpal's palace, many of which today adorn the walls of the British Museum in London. But in contrast to Nimrud Antiquity's revered state in the British Museum, Bell found the ancient remains of the site itself much neglected. Laird's old excavation pits and holes were filled to the brim with grass and flowers, and it was impossible to trace the lines of the ancient walls. She also found it very distressing that several excavated sculptured stones, which had not been previously removed, like this one, lay half exposed in the ground and had been subjected to vandalism and damage from the elements. So you can see this large statue of an Assyrian god whose upper half was exposed above the ground, his nose and ears much defaced. And this pair of stone-carved human-headed, actually human-chested also, uh, uh, lions leaning into the ancient doorway they once would have guarded. These centaurs actually guarded one of the main doors to the throne room of the palace of Ashurnasir Paul II and were later restored to their upright position. They continued to stand there in the doorway until recent tragic events perpetrated by Islamic State militants. A video released by the Islamic State in April 2015 shows that much of the palace's in situ contents were vandalized and smashed, after which the militants used barrel bombs to blow up the palace. The grand and highly celebrated palace of the Assyrian king, king of the four quarters of the world, for which Bell showed so much concern over a century ago, has been obliterated, and a giant field of debris marks its once proud place at that site. It's very sad. I saved my discussion of this site, of Ukadir for the last, because I feel that one can best gauge the value and strength of Bell's contribution to the field of archaeology through her study of this amazing site. And it still is intact, by the way. Bell visited Ukadir in March of 1909, after she had turned away from the Euphrates River and had made her way south and east through the desert to reach this remote place. This impressive and lonely site had rarely been visited by any European, and nobody had ever carried out a systematic study of its architecture or knew anything about its date or function. To Bell, this castle was the most exciting and fortuitous thing she could possibly have found, as her careful investigations of it would be the ultimate endeavor to help establish herself as a credible archaeologist. She quickly set up camp and set about in earnest, measuring, recording, drawing, and photographing this edifice. You can see here, if it'll go, there it does, um, the sketch plan uh, from one of her field notebooks of the southeastern corner of the palace. Each of the numbers there stands for the dimensions of the rooms or walls uh, in centimeters. And I should point out, by the way, that Bell didn't have any sophisticated surveying equipment on her trips. All of the planning was done with a compass, uh, uh, a measuring tape, uh, and also a foot rule. And you can also see Belle there in the act of planning the castle with her guards who are holding the measuring tape. She's holding the notebook out of which that page came that I just showed you. Um, and she, uh, in, her, in her diary, she com- actually complains about uh, her guards, the fact that they never took their rifles off, her sh- off their shoulders. And the measuring tape was forever getting caught up in the barrel or the butt of their, of their weapons, which was very fr- annoying to her. 
And there you can see her final plan of the castle, which she drew up showing the complex to consist of a central palace, which you see here, the central building. That pointer's not working. Anyway, you can see the central building, uh, surrounded by outer fortification walls with solid round buttress towers at regular intervals. Um, you can see some of her photographs of that defensive system from the outside, those uh, round towers, and then on the interior, on the exterior as well as the interior, you get these blind arcades, like you see there, the arches, the blind arches in between. The palace within the walls is characterized by several interior rooms and courts. The covered rooms characterized by columns, niches, fluted semi-domes, and ceilings covered with decorative brick and plaster work. As you can see in the case of the top right-hand corner there, which shows part of the vaulted uh, uh, cloister of the castle's mosque. The largest covered interior space is occupied by the so-called Great Hall, this room characterized by a large pointed barrel vaulted ceiling done in brick. There you can see another view of it. Uh, this is a seven meter wide vault, 15.5 meters in length and 10.5 meters in height. This is a very impressive and well-preserved ceiling. Now, time present, uh, prevents me uh, from detailing all of Bell's extensive research at Ukadir, but I can highlight some of her, a few of her most astute observations and conclusions, especially those that have a bearing on the date and identity of this complex. And I can comment briefly on what other scholars have said about her work. Um, first of all, you can see there the publications, the main publications of the castle of Ukadir, which include the top three Bell's own reports, beginning with her article entitled The Vaulting System of Ukadir, which appeared in the journal, journal of Hellenic Studies in 1910. This was followed by her description of the site in her travel account, Amarath to Amarath, in 1911. And then we have her last final and full report, published by Clarendon Press in 1914, entitled The Palace and Mosque at Ukadir. Besides Bell's works, you can also see there the German report on Ukadir, entitled Ukadir, which was written by Oskar Reuter on behalf of the Deutsche Orient Gesellschaft in 1912 with the assistance of Friedrich Wetzel and Karl Müller. And this report, as you can see by the date, came out two years before Bell's final report in 1914. And it's actually quite intriguing as to how this came about. It seems that while Bell came to the site of Babylon in 1909, after having just visited Ukadir, she was very excited about her desert discovery and was very forthcoming as to the location and appearance of the castle with the German members of the archaeological team at Babylon. What appears to have happened is that after Bell had departed and eventually went back to England, two members of that German team at Babylon decided to visit Ukadir themselves and actually ended up spending several days there making their own plans and drawings and producing their own report, which is this one, this 1912 publication, which then did come out earlier than Bell's final publication. The fact of the matter is, however, that the Germans would never have even known about Ukadir if Bell hadn't drawn their attention to it in the first place. So one could very much regard this as a tremendous scoop on their part. Now, Bell never said anything disparaging about her German colleagues in any of her letters or diaries or publications, although to be sure, this must have been quite a disappointing blow for her at this time. It was, after all, at this point in her life when she was was most anxious to make a name for herself through some outstanding archaeological discovery, and this did take away somewhat from that achievement. The German version provides a very uh, careful, comprehensive description of the palace at Ukadir with all of its architectural features. It has an excellent plan of the complex. It has beautiful drawings and reconstructions uh, uh, within it, which really bring the place alive. Nevertheless, unlike Bell's reports, there is very little attempt to situate the castle within the wider context of architectural developments within the early Islamic world and beyond nor does it attempt, beyond a few cursory suggestions, to guess at where Ukadir's architects gained their inspiration. And it's on these issues that Bell's own reports are far more probing and complete. 
The other publication, I'll just list briefly, briefly there at the bottom, is the KAC Cresswell's magnum opus uh, entitled Early Muslim Architecture, which was published in two volumes in 1932 and 1940. And, ni- sorry, 1940. Volume two contains a lengthy report on Ukadir, and this account of the site, given Cresswell's wide reputation as a noted expert on Islamic architecture, is frequently cited by later scholars. Now, you can see some here, uh, some of the features, uh, a list of what are probably Bell's most important observations at Ukadir. They are mostly architectural observations, this being the subject that was the most closely investigated and considered by archaeologists back in Bell's time. And again, I don't have uh, time to uh, describe all these uh, details, but I'll just mention two. So I'll just mention the first item there that I've got, and then I'll go down to the fourth one. So with regard to Sasanian influences, so the Sasanian period of the Middle East dates back to the 3rd to 7th century CE, and it is marked by the presence of a Persian dynasty of kings who came from Iran, but who over the course of their reigns were able to expand into other parts of the Middle East, including parts of Mesopotamia or Iraq. Sasanian architects developed a very particular style of building during these periods, and what Bell noticed was that Ukaidir appears to have some of those Sasanian elements demonstrated, for example, in the ways in which uh, its interior rooms and courtyards were arranged within the palace complex. So this, according to her, would date the castle close to the Sasanian period. In fact, she postulated that it would come shortly after uh, the Sasanian period was over, so sometime after the 7th century. She also also noticed some interesting architectural features like the brick vaulting at Ukaidir and noted that it was borrowing directly from Sasanian antecedents. So what you're looking at there is part of the remains of a brick vault from the Sasanian site of Tesaphon, which is in Iraq. And you can see the unusual way in which they have set the vault with these uh, uh, courses of bricks laid horizontally. And then above that, you have bricks being uh, put up on the vertical in courses. And what they actually did was they started at the headwall and they leaned the bricks slightly against the headwall. And then all the subsequent courses of bricks were leaned also against those and affixed with mortar. Uh, you can see that more clearly in that particular case. This is actually a form of brick vaulting that goes all the way back to the 8th century, going back to the period of the Assyrians, this being noted at Korsabad, an Assyrian site that you probably all know well. Um, so this, has a, uh, this is a time-honored uh, tradition of making brick vaults that goes way back into antiquity, but then was passed through the Sasanians and then appears at Ukadir as well. So that magnificent great hall was done with the same type of brick vaulting as, you, as well as this uh, smaller room, which you see here. Okay, Um, so the other two features that I'm going to pass over really have to do with her um, uh, getting at the dates. Uh, uh, better for Ukadir. The presence of groin vaults or cross vaults is something that came from the West, but didn't start appearing in Muslim architecture until about the uh, 8th century. So that was a a good indication that she's looking around that time period. Similarly, the presence of small domes, she's got domes, but they're not very, they're not, they're not lovely. They're, they're very primitive in their inspiration. And so that was, that was a clue to her that we're looking at, again, a fairly early date in the Islamic period. And then finally, we've got the presence of a mosque. Bell first expressed her guests that the area in the northwestern corner of the palace was a mosque in her earliest publication, and she continued to assert this identification in all subsequent reports. And the positive confirmation of this presence of the mosque came in 1909. She was back in England, but she asked a French archaeologist, Henri Violette, um, she, she knew he was traveling to uh, Mesopotamia, and she asked him to visit Ukadir and to clear away the middle of the south wall to see if there was a mihrab or a prayer niche there. He did that, and sure enough, he found it. So it's that thing, you see that little niche right there, which was just poking up in that photo above all the, uh, the rubble uh, that had fallen down. So this really confirmed the site's Islamic date, and moreover because the mihrab is of the concave type, and such niches only begin to occur after 709 CE. It means that the date of Ukadir's construction cannot be any earlier than that. 
Bell's date of the mid 8th century CE for Ukadir is based on all of the observations made above as well as her consideration of the arches of Ukadir, which are at a point of transition between round to ovoid to pointed. They are not as developed as the fully pointed arches at the site of Samara in Iraq, which are dated to the end of the 8th century. Um, Now, we can also ask what uh, later scholars thought of all this scholarship. And what we find is that almost all of the observations that she made, they agree with. So they're pretty much on top uh, of all of those things. The only exception is Cresswell, who gives a slightly later date than Bell's date for Ukadir. So her date is 750 CE, his is 775, and that's based on some historical details that he uh, knew about uh, for the period of the early uh, Abbasid caliphs. But otherwise, this was really a great achievement. We really do have to give her credit for producing a fine investigation of Ukadir that was largely that has largely stood the test of time. Her analysis is scholarly and sophisticated. It is comparable and even surpasses the archaeological reports of her contemporaries. So certainly on the basis of this work, archaeology can be listed as a field of study in which Gertrude Bell became fully accomplished. I can't, I don't have enough time to talk further about this, but if I did look into further archaeological reports, we would still, we would find in them the same careful attention to details and comprehensive uh, 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 treatment. I leave the site of Ukadir now, showing here another view of this uh, magnificent facade with the shadow of the photographer Gertrude in the foreground. Gertrude Bell's 1909 and 1911 journeys to Mesopotamia and her visits and observations of the region's great sites and monuments would continue to resonate throughout her life. They especially had a strong impact upon the way she perceived the newly formed country of Iraq and its development as an independent nation. She recognized that Iraq's rich cultural heritage, which had involved countless centuries of civilizations and cultural splendors, was a way of empowering this new country and imbuing it with its own national pride and identity. And so with this in mind, she even tried to educate the king, Faisal, about his new country's eventful past. So you can see here a photograph dated to the year of Faisal's coronation in 1921, showing Gertrude here with the new king, Faisal, enjoying a picnic at the site of Tessaphon, where there still stands this fabulous Sasanian palace with its gigantic barrel vaulted roof. Uh, Bell had first visited Tessaphon in 1909 and had been most impressed with it. This was a very special moment for Gertrude, for she was able to vividly reconstruct the history of that great site to Faisal as they walked within the palace and looked out over the Tigris River, where once legions of Muslim soldiers had marched from Mecca to this site in order to take it as a prize from the Persians. It was a tale of his own people. She wrote home to her father. You can imagine what it was like reciting it to him. I don't know which of us was more thrilled. Personally, I find this event to be one of the most astounding in Bell's career. Here, after all, was the new king of Iraq being told the story of the Arab people, his people, by an English woman, no less. The fact that she felt entitled to relate this information at all seems rather incredible to us now, but this episode not only captures nicely the potent personality of Belle herself at this time and the close relationship she had with the king, she really was a force to be reckoned with, but also the tremendous influence and power of the British Empire, which at this time was playing a key role in the politics of the Middle East, and felt entitled through its various political agents like Bell to weigh in on the affairs of this country. Despite all of this hubris and Bell's optimistic hopes for the future of Iraq, one of the very interesting aspects of her personality is how she often found herself deeply conflicted over her decisions and actions. And this included her responsibilities in Iraq and her role as a kingmaker and policy advisor. Her letters to her parents back in England are replete 
with statements that reveal her fears and doubts about the wisdom of her actions and England's interference in the complicated affairs of the people of Iraq. And in addition, Bell was very much aware of the transitory nature of power in this part of the world. Her extensive knowledge of Mesopotamia's tumultuous history had taught her that. And she was also, to a certain extent, aware of her own encounter in this foreign land, um, and that as a Westerner and an outsider, it was to be but a brief one. So even back in 1909, when she was sitting on a hill that commanded a wide view over the rolling hills that stretched away from the Tigris River below the ancient city of Nimrud, she wrote the following in a letter to her father. The whole world shone like a jewel, green crops and blue waters, and far away the gleaming snows of the mountains that bound Mesopotamia to the north. We saw them today for the first time. I sat on the hilltop for half an hour and considered the history of Asia that was spread out before me. Here Mithridates murdered the Greek generals. Here Xenophon began his command, and just beyond the Zab, the Greeks turned and defeated the archers of Mithridates, marching then on to Larissa, the mound of Nimrud, where Xenophon saw the great Assyrian city standing in ruins. Nimrud stood out among the cornfields at my feet. A little further east, I could see the plain of Arbala, where Alexander conquered Asia. We, the people of the West, can always conquer, but we can never hold Asia. That seemed to me to be the legend written across this landscape. That's a very interesting and prescient statement, given how it foretells things in the future of this country, even beyond Bell's own lifetime. I'll just finish by taking you back to, uh, to England. So when Gertrude Bell died in 1926, she was buried in the British Cemetery in Baghdad. And while I haven't been to visit her grave there, I have been to the village of East Roughton in North Yorkshire, where you can find several of the other Bell family graves together in one part of the little village churchyard. So here you can find her father, Hugh, her two brothers, Morris and Hugo, and you can see there uh, my husband uh, clearing the moss off the inscriptions on the tombstones. And uh, the one grave we were most struck by was that of Gertrude's grandfather, Sir Isaac Lothian Bell. Actually, it's quite a modest grave given the stature of this individual. He was one of England's leading industrialists of the Victorian era. And we were especially moved by the inscription on one side of the tomb that reads, children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. And I find that very fitting as it stresses the great pride that the Bells had in their family and in the recognition not only of the achievements of the grandfather, but of the continuing importance of the achievements of his offspring as well. And especially with that first part of the inscription, children's children are the crown of old men, it was as if already by the time of Sir Lothian's death in 1904 that there was the recognition that his grandchildren, which would include Gertrude, would be remarkable in their own right. And indeed, they were. So that's it. Sorry I went on a bit long. Thank you.